Well, welcome to the show. It's been four months since I spoke to uh, this guest, <laughs> today's guest. Uh, Lee Sargent is back with me. We're talking track. Lee, welcome back to Track Zone. Yeah, thank you for having me again for, after so long. Um, we were going to do this regularly, but life happens. <laughs> life does happen. Uh, having said that, though, I, I, we recorded at the start of January, uh, mm. but I did hold off and, and release the episodes sporadically. So I think for folks playing along at home, it hasn't been as long. Uh, in fact, I I think we spoke about the animated series uh, yes. in April. Uh, that yep. one was released in April. So that's pretty that's good. Right. But today we're talking about The Next Generation, the first live action spin off series uh, of our beloved franchise. Uh, what are your recollections, your memories of, of this uh, series, Lee? Uh, well, I remember, uh, I remember certainly when it came out, because uh, it came out probably uh, a couple of years after obviously in the US here in Australia. And I certainly remember the first season. I remember uh, the figurines in the shops, um, which are, which I, which I, cause I remember them being in a big discount bin, funny enough. <laughs> um, and, and being excited to see this discount bin with Star Trek written on the side and, and kind of running over and grabbing kind of a whole handful of these, these tiny figurines and going, hang on a second. Who are these people? <laughs> um, because I'm pretty certain they released the toys here in Australia before they actually released the show, um, which would have been confusing, I suspect, for some, um, because there was no kind of, you know, obviously they didn't they didn't look the same, and there was no kind of idea of what was going on. There was no internet back then, so obviously we we only had kind of what was showing up in magazines. And I was probably too young to afford Starlog magazine because um, as soon as you import a magazine into Australia triples its price and uh <laughs> the joys so of being australian yeah that's it well back then anyway now it's not so bad but back then it was like uh yeah you'd wait a couple of years for tv shows and and anything kind of imported into the news agency would be expensive uh so i remember it kind of coming on tv and i remember kind of um i remember some of the i, I remember a feeling of disappointment uh because i didn't like the new enterprise uh and i and I was kind of like, yeah, but what about kind of the, the Star Trek that I know and love? And being very young at the time too, uh, didn't kind of, it wasn't a very well formed uh, vibe of kind of dealing with this new show. But I mean, the thing is, it's like with, with anything, you kind of start watching it and, and it was a very kind of reassuring show and and uh, grew to love it. It wasn't until though, in fairness, and I will kind of out myself here it wasn't until generations that i actually fell in love with the enterprise d fell in love with the enterprise d wow by then it was interesting <laughs> well I, th I think in generations i kind of saw it shot so well um that i kind of wrapped my head around how it moved properly and stuff like that because we we saw the the enterprise d kind of move a fair bit in generations and it was shot beautifully um despite kind of whatever anyone might think of the show, the movie itself. So yeah, it wasn't until then that I kind of really kind of went, you yeah, know, I like the enterprise D and then they crashed it and I went, oh, okay, well that's, <laughs> that's bad timing. Uh, but yeah, I like and, uh, next generation was always a, it was, it was always a kind of, it was a mainstay obviously of my teenage years. So um, whilst I was, uh, I will always be an original Star Trek kind of first, Next Generation was, it stood perfectly on its own. Well, it was originally pitched to the then fledgling Fox Network in the 19, in 1985 and 86. That's right, yeah. Um, but they couldn't guarantee uh, a, an episode order greater than 13 episodes, which probably defeats the purpose of creating all the sets and spending the millions of dollars to start up a series. Um, and then Mel, Mel... The irony now is, of course, most series any most good quality series are um 13 episodes now so <laughs> exactly it's yeah it's a bit of synergy that we've come back to yeah i think so well Mel Harris, the uh, president of Paramount Television, then decided to oversee it uh, as a syndicated TV show, which I don't think had ever been done before. And many of the stations that carried Next Gen uh, had also carried the original series for a long time. The official fan club magazine came out in 1987, um, and we learned a few tidbits uh, from there. Uh, it was originally planned to be... TNG was originally set to be planned in the 25th century, 150 years after Kirk and Company. And it would have been the NCC 1701G 
uh, probably a good idea, Lee, that he that he stepped that back uh, <laughs> about fifty years and, and a couple of generations of ship. Well, it certainly made the episode unification easier to do. <laughs> <laughs> we can bring back uh, Spock, and of course. Two parters, uh, you know, mentioning their unification. Uh, Next Gen really set the stage for what Star Trek would be become. Um, two parters, cliffhangers, the best of both worlds. Uh, you can't go past uh, for the entire. So I, I don't know because um, I wasn't Defensive quite around level. for this. Were well, uh, yeah, you know, were, were we really expected to believe that Picard was going to leave the show? Well, you got to remember too. First season, we lost Tasha Yar. True. So, and again. The show wasn't talked about or written about to the extent that, well, it was, I mean, it was, but yeah, we didn't have the internet, which is again, you know, the caveat that I keep putting down there is the internet <laughs> has enabled so much more navel gazing when it comes to these things. So the reality is watching a, a show, you can, you could kind of go, this could happen type of thing. They may do this, or if they don't do it, it may change the status quo of the show. We were still naive, I guess, at that, that stage. So, which was a good place to be when watching Best of Both Worlds because, you know, it, it is probably one of the greatest cliffhangers of of television history and extraordinarily well played. Uh, I love the fact the story behind the, the scenes that they kind of, it, it was the end of, of uh, a group of writers on the show <laughs> who just kind of handed it over and went, yeah, enjoy that. Have fun with that. <laughs> yeah, and walked off type of thing and said, you know, that's fine. You, you guys need to come back and resolve it somehow <laughs> um, where we're going to write it. So, And which is always the best television, I think, of, of if you're going to write a cliffhanger, um, the best television is, yeah, writing it like you're not coming back and I'm not trying, you know, like it's not your problem. <laughs> we even saw that kind of repeated in Enterprise when um, – you know, they, they resolved the Zindi conflict and then and then, and then right at the end they go, oh, look, Nazis, um, enjoy. <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, I'm not writing that tomorrow, so that's your problem, not mine. Uh, so next show, so Best of Both Worlds was, and, and really was a watershed moment for the show. It, it was always in the, the lexicon, but it was, uh, it, it really became a water cooler kind of conversation, which is one of my kind of, I think, issues with modern day Trek mm. is that we just don't seem to have captured that attention from the greater public uh, as far as we're not talking about, uh, you know, this isn't must-see TV necessarily. This is still, it's must-see TV for all of us Star Trek fans, uh, but it's not something that's necessarily drawing in other people as far as, uh, say, something like Game of Thrones does or, or whatever type of thing, mm. uh, where it becomes, you become ostracised in the office if you don't watch it, whereas you only become ostracised from you know, your little social circles if you don't watch the Star Trek. Um, but Best of both worlds, I think, transcended that uh, definitely, and because I know a lot of people who who watched Next Generation because of the Borg and because of that introduction, and went, you know what, this is just a, a really good episode, and it's a great introduction episode to to anyone who's kind of like who wants to jump on board and has a general knowledge of, oh look, okay, this is there's uh, you know starships and at a crew. But here you go. Here's the actual characters. Uh, I think it's a really great episode for that. So that was, yeah, that was super exciting. I do need to pull you up, though. Um, obviously, you, you're talking about the two-part ep mm. episodes. I, I do need to point out the Menagerie was a two-part episode of original Star Trek. And Yeah, but it so, wasn't a big cliffhanger, though. It, well, it was reasonably, it was well. reasonably interesting. <laughs> Spock was um, on, on, Spock's life was on the line. Um, but, yes, no, I, I concede the point uh, because... <laughs> Best of Both Worlds was was designed to be an exceptional cliffhanger that would drag people back to the show. Mm. Um, and my word, it did that extraordinarily well. Well, Trek Zone's all about snackable content these days. So in the best traditions of the Best of Both Worlds, it's time for a break. Leave a comment below about your favourite TNG moment and Lee and I will be back tomorrow to continue chatting about the next generation. 